back to another edition of Read Science, where we like to discuss with authors about how they communicate science to the general public through their writing and their books. Today we have uh, something a little bit different. What we have is a wildlife photographer, Susie Esterhaz, who is, um, oh, I'm going to pull up her bio, it's not showing on my thing here, um, who has written some children's books. Now, her books are based primarily on her photography. Um, she is based in California, and she spends several months of the year shooting a wide variety of wildlife in the field. And uh, she has specialized in documenting family life of endangered species and has become well known for her work with newborn animals. And that's the focus of her books that we have here. Um, she is a fellow of the International League of Conservation Photographers and has won awards in many competitions, including the Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition, National Wildlife Photo Contest, and Environmental Photographer of the Year competition. So um, she has many organizations, conservation organizations that she uh, supports, and we will be talking about that in addition to how do you write a book for children that portrays nature appropriately um, and reaches their level and uh, possibly inspires them to take care of the earth in the future. So uh, welcome, Susie. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Really glad to have you. So uh, what I want to start with first are your books so that people uh, get an idea. Now, I follow you on Facebook, and I think, you know, I had a friend following you on Facebook, and I'm like, who's that? Oh, wait, she's got books. So I immediately started following, and, uh, and I just love because you post things that say, oh, look, here's my some photographs of mine that have made it to uh, Ranger Rick and to this, <laughs> you know, so you've been in all sorts of journals you know, from uh, very well-known ones for adults to ones for kids, and um, it's just fantastic. So um, so Susie was so, so kind to send along to me uh, her books from her series, which uh, number in six right now, but you're expanding that, right? Yeah, so we've got two more titles on the way coming out. Great. So I'm just going to hold them up in series here. So this cheetah one, I don't know, has elicited the most who's and ahs. I don't, maybe just cute cats. <laughs> just excite people with the internet world of cats. So we've got orangutan. They're really adorable photos. Isn't, isn't it true that these are um, tested by, by teenage girls at your house uh, <laughs> for, their, for their giggle factor? <laughs> yes. Well, so it's been a long time since I've had kids of the age that would be reading this book. So I, I'm going to guess, you know, you could read these books to kids as young as babies. Um, yeah. But when they start reading on their own, you're probably looking at up what up to age seven or eight. Um, four to seven is the four to seven is yeah. what they've um, uh, de designated these as. Um, so the language level is appropriate for that. But I would definitely, if I had toddlers, I'd be reading this to them. So since I have only twenties uh, and teens anymore, um, it, it's funny though. They they get really excited when they see these books and just. They will just sit there and look at them. And as an adult, I enjoy them too. Um, so uh, what I might want mm -hmm. to do here is to grab one of these. And uh, well, unless you have one there and you want to read a little bit of text, but just to give people an idea of the text level, would sure. you like to read or should I read? You go ahead. Yeah, I don't have one handy here. So <laughs> you, you see the pictures here all the time, don't you? So, um, yeah. <laughs> so, so for instance, here's... Um, Here's the image uh, from the page I will be reading. So obviously it's a suckling uh, newborn here. So it says, cheetah cubs are always hungry. They need to drink a lot of their mother's milk so they will grow big and strong. Sometimes when mom is away hunting, they don't drink for almost the whole day. And then they get really hungry. The cubs drink milk every day until they are three months old. So this is the, the level of the language we are looking at. And the print is um, large enough. Uh, that obviously when little eyes are looking at this, they need the, the bigger print. So looking at this, um, I'm curious. So did this start as, you know, I've got all these photographs. Let me make a children's book. Did someone approach you and say, hey, you've got all these photographs. Would you like to make a children's book? Or you, had you always had these ideas in your mind and then said, well, let me uh, choose some photos to go with this? 
Well, I think all of these started as magazine stories, whether they were adult stories for like, you know, BBC Wildlife or Smithsonian or whatever, or children's um, stories for Ranger Rick or National Geographic Kids. They all sort of started that way. And then once I sort of, you know, after doing this for years and had this sort of collection of different species, um, I kind of started thinking about, you know, getting into the children's book publishing world. But it was something I thought about for years before I actually kind of dove in. A lot of that was just because of, of my own time constraints. It's very time consuming to, you know, to A, shop around book ideas and find the right publisher and then B, you know, pull all the images together and write the text and all that. Um, along with my other deadlines, I just didn't have time for a while. But then I kind of carved out some time. And originally, actually, for the series, I, I pitched 10 um, species, 10 titles. And the, um, the publisher sort of was like, you know, you're an unpublished author in the book world, so, you know, we'll just do six, which was actually pretty good for someone who's unpublished to, to land six at once. I was really happy about that and, and very happy with my publisher. So it was actually a very a positive process that kind of all came together after years of thinking about it. Were you already interested in the... Uh the young animals to growing up, as as I saw mentioned, the sort of birth to adult story visually, where you already doing uh, the baby animals and things, and then you thought about children's books, and then now everyone can say, what a stroke of genius, baby animals for children. Um, you know, I have always been interested in that whole growing up baby concept. Um, yeah. I think as a child, I read a lot. You know, I read Ranger Rick, and at that time we had National Geographic World, and I read that. Um, and I think it's, you know, that telling that kind of growing up life cycle is a, is a really good way of getting kids to relate to animals because they're going through kind of some of the same things. Mm. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things about what I've always been interested in is using sort of the the young animals, the baby animals, as like a center stage for telling this drama of, you know, what animals go, what their life cycle is, and talking about different species or single species. Um, and all the things that these animals face as they're growing up is used as like a center stage, but there's a lot of different stuff kind of swirling around, like for the adult stories, there's conservation, there's research. Um, you know, there's different aspects, but all kind of surrounding this really sort of amazing drama. And sometimes that's cute and fuzzy, like for kids, obviously, it's got to be cute and fuzzy. But, you know, for adults, it's also sometimes really sort of harrowing and very dramatic. You know, babies mm -hmm. die, um, they face predators, parents are often really, you know, getting into these dramatic fights to protect their young. So there's a lot of sort of less warm and fuzzy things that happen as well. But that sort of dramatic angle always really interested me. And then, of course, it's a natural fit for children, the children's publishing and the children's magazine industry. It's a great fit. So, you know, sort of came together at that. But a lot of the magazine pieces that were done in the children's market, they were done based on this growing up baby theme. Some of them had been. So there was always, you know, sort of that focus there. I'm sure, I'm sure we're going to talk about appropriate language in a lot of different ways. But the one that comes to mind while you're talking is with this whole life cycle thing, and we're talking about wild animals, and we're talking about baby animals in this wildlife setting, and it's it's not the most hospitable place for babies. And so, you know, there's a line where you, someplace where you want to have uh, a realistic story, I think. You want to tell things uh, in a truthful way, and you don't want anything that is too sanitized nor too uh, harrowing. What do you think about when you're looking for that story with the fact that, yes, babies die, they get carried off by hawks, their bodies get ripped apart. Uh, there are things you don't really need to mention right now, but maybe some idea that you want to give that, that it's a tough life. Yeah, you know, I think it's difficult. I think for ages four to seven, it's a very difficult thing to touch on. You know, there were a couple things that I sort of went back and forth with the publisher, we kind of talked about, do we want to show um, Cheetah Mom chasing a gazelle, for example? Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. very important to talk about mom bringing home the bacon. Um, and kids, you know, need to understand that and how important it is and survival and, and what a job mom has, not just in protecting outright, but also feeding these hungry mouths. 
And, and yeah, and I saw that the one that I've I've had a chance to look at was Cheetah, and mm -hmm. I saw that picture, and then the text with it does say, "Here's mother. She's looking for dinner," but doesn't talk about you know bringing down the gazelle or anything. But it it seemed like it did say that this was here, and you know further discussion and other programs will reveal that. I'm sorry. Yeah. So go well, ahead. well, I think you know with kids, especially four to seven, you can't exactly you know the next image which the stranglehold or the breaking of the neck and you can't exactly show that to a four to seven year old because they're going to get completely traumatized and you know you don't want to traumatize them so much that they lose interest in nature. Right. You know, I think there's a real balance. I remember as a child going to Bambi with my mom <laughs> and being so traumatized that we had to leave the theater. She had mm -hmm. to drag me out because I was sobbing and I was a wreck you know but mm -hmm. but it did profoundly affect me and maybe it was in a positive way but but I definitely think we sort of, you know, we need a balance, but we can't hide the fact that, you know, yeah, animals are eaten and mom has to catch them. Um, do we want to talk about siblings dying when it's ages four to seven? Probably not. You know, they're, yeah. they're, that's a little young for that. Ages seven to 14? Yeah, I think we can touch on that kind of thing for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're talking about the real little ones, it's definitely a real balance. And that's part of the challenge of writing these stories is finding that balance of, of what these kids can, can digest and, and what yes. is a little much. And just before I'm going to, just before I let Joanne ask anything, this is another theme that when we talked about beforehand, I told you I'm very interested in is I, the, the, I think the thing that bothers me the most or that I admire the most in many of the science outlook books that we read is, um, uh, I'm starting to think, you know, this is sort of the first principle for a science writer is, you know, first, do, do nothing imprecise. You don't want to give misleading, incorrect, inaccurate information, um, but you can't tell everything in a technical way or, in this case, to modify that, in a disturbing way that is not yet age appropriate. And so I saw this in Cheetah that was very nice but you have to choose your words very carefully so that you don't say anything misleading at the same time that you don't uh, talk too graphically, say, about this mother chasing the cheetah so that then this can be modified later in the life of the reader uh, without you know, perturbing sort of these mental um, learning. Right. And, I, you know, the critics, I think most of the reviews we've had have been extremely positive, which is great. The couple bad comments we've had from critics have been surrounding the idea of, you know, some of my words are a little anthropomorphic. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's absolutely right that some of them are mm -hmm. a little anthropomorphic. But one of the things about communicating with children that are real little is I think you have to be, you know, and of course the critics that made the comment would argue with me, but I think to make wildlife and nature interesting to very little children, you have to be anthropomorphic in a way because you have to give mm -hmm. them something to relate to. If you don't, kids are going to get bored and they're going to switch off. They're just, they're just not going to be interested. And I can agree with you that with these, particularly these young kids, to engage and to have them understand that you can use that anthropomorphizing in a way that I don't think will mislead them or set them up for confusion when they're 26 years. They see cartoons too, and when they're young enough, they're able to develop uh, an empathy with cartoon characters, with anthropomorphic characteristics, but also to understand quite readily that that's not real. Yeah. And I, I think you can do that uh, in a sensitive way that, that engages them and tells them what they need to know, and yet doesn't you know, ruin them for the next 30 years or anything. That's Well, that's I think you have silly. to have a real nice balance with, you know, you can use some anthropomorphic language, but you have to have the science information in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have to give them the natural history facts to go with it. You just yeah. have to give them, you kind of have to dress it up on a little platter that they can that to eat, um, but you have to give them nutritious food. You can't give them candy is the way that I look at it, you know. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, I'm looking here at the gorilla book and mm -hmm. this image right here and the mom is holding the baby but uh, you know you see an expression on their faces and I think you know what a wonderful picture that a kid can relate to mm -hmm. you know being held by their mom um, mm -hmm. and that mom is there to take care of them 
And, you know, so in that way, I think even if you didn't have anthropomorphizing words, they're going to do that anyway. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah. so in, in your choice of pictures, you you are telling a story, you know, and with the, the cliche that a picture, you know, is worth a thousand words, you, you know, you don't need so many words, right? Because there is this image that yeah. conveys a lot of meaning. Yeah. And there's a lot of emotion there, you know, and... And um, yeah, and that's another one, the grooming and how meticulous they are with the grooming. And, um, you know, the babies are sort of flinching. They don't really like it. Just, you know, it's, it's something all kids can relate to. That's right. I think, you know, <laughs> but mom, I don't want a bath. <laughs> <laughs> Do I have to? Um, so uh, now I, I would like to ask about these photos about your life as a wildlife photographer because this is you know it's just one of those things where you grow up and if you watch really good National Geographic shows you're looking at these images and I all I can do is enjoy the images I can't even begin to put myself in the place of someone who is <laughs> taking the photos and then choosing which ones to to use and things like that so I, I understand this is probably a really broad you know, topic to get into, but um, what is it like to to be a wildlife photographer? Um, that is that's a big question. <laughs> I know, and and I'm sorry, but to me, it's something I can't even uh, grab a hold of myself. Um, you know, it, to, yeah, you sit for hours and hours just taking pictures, and then hours and hours sorting through the pictures, and um, well, I, I don't even know where to begin. Yeah, I mean, the hours and hours taking photos and the hours and hours sorting through photos, and then there's a lot many more hours where you're not taking any photos at all and you're just waiting for something to happen or looking for something. And that, I mean, there's extreme patience involved in my career, particularly if you're working with um, families. So one of the things that, you know, some of my subjects have required me to habituate them to my presence. So for some of these animals, you know, jackals are my greatest example. I worked with this jackal family for about five and a half months, and it took 17 days to habituate the parents to my presence. So that means 17 days of no photos, that's 17 days sunrise to sunset, just getting my Jeep a little bit closer and a little bit closer and a little bit closer to the den site until, you know, they're very used to me and very comfortable. Um, so establishing that sort of level of trust and that kind of I like to call it a working relationship with an animal. Um, so, you know, they will essentially tolerate you being there and um, in the end not even notice that you're there. That's the ultimate goal is that you just sort of disappear and you become invisible and become part of the landscape. You're like, you know, your Jeep becomes a boulder, that kind of thing. But it takes a lot of hard work and patience to get there. And for some of these species, it's, you know, some of them started off, right off the bat very easy. Mountain girls are a great example. They've been habituated for, you know, 20 plus years, probably 40 plus years at this point, um, by scientists and tourists. And um, so going in and getting close to them, it's no problem. It's super easy to do. Um, there are other challenges that come with gorillas, but habituation is not one of them. Then there are animals that really require a lot of time. The cheetah book, all those images are over like a two year period. So they were the ones that I, you know, spent a lot of time doing. So it really varies according to species in terms of, you know, the kind of um, adventures that I went through doing it. What, what I can say about, you know, in general about what I do, I think the best part is that every day is different. Um, and that, that can be a good thing and it can also be a bad thing. You can have an amazing day where you shoot, you know, 3,000 photos of penguins on blue ice and it's mind-boggling and the next day you get nothing. Um, but it is, it keeps it exciting. Every day is different in the field. Um, back in the office looking at the computer doing Photoshop work, that is, you know, monotonous and tedious just like any computer work is. It's not glamorous. You know, I've got neck problems from working my mouse so much. It's, you know, there's some very not glamorous parts, not to mention, you know, tromping through jungles and getting ticks up your nose or having bugs lay eggs in your feet, that kind of thing. Um, that's not glamorous either. But you know, there are some really exciting, some really fun parts to the job, and clearly I love it because, you know, no one does this for, for money. Um, you do it because you love it, um, and, uh, and I do love it still, you know, but it, it definitely can be exhausting and very trying. I guess we were hoping, Joanne, to find the, the perfect 
all glamorous all the time uh, career here, and and now we're disillusioned. <laughs> I'm lucky if I could get a good picture on my iPhone. Actually, it's, my dad calls those PhD cameras push here dummy. So uh, this, <laughs> this is not, not my <laughs> not not my field. Um, so how many years have you been doing this? Because you're quite accomplished really to have these books to be in so many publications um, is is it a, an a, a I would assume some balance of the time you have spent doing this and maybe a bit of uh, natural talent how much of that comes into play well I think a lot of it is dedication and hard work um, you know I I did have so I've been doing this full-time for about 10 years maybe a little more at this point um, and Prior to that, I had a day job. So when I got out of college, you know, there was absolutely no way I was going to be able to just sort of get into wildlife photography. I knew it was very competitive, very difficult to make a living. I didn't have any money. Um, so I got a day job, and I worked that day job for six years and did my wildlife photography at the same time. So I was super dedicated, total workaholic. I'm still a workaholic. I'm working on that. I'm trying to have more work-life balance, but it's not easy with this job. Um, and, you know, I think all that you have to work like six days a week, if not seven days a week, if you want to make this career. And then, yeah, there, there's some talent that comes with it. And then also just luck, you know, and, and, and being, you know, lucky to get certain breaks or, you know, certain experiences. Um, but I would say the vast majority of it is, is perseverance. I always tell young people because mm -hmm. they always ask me, like, you know, how'd you get into it, blah, blah, blah. And I always say, you just got to persevere. It's, you know, it That's gets tough. hard and you're poor, you're broke. I had an enormous amount of debt um, in the beginning. And you just have to sort of get through it. And if you love it, I think that you can make it. But you have to really love it more than, like, anything else going on in your life. And it's very, you know, I also, too, you know, I don't have children. And... I think it's it's very difficult, particularly for women, to make it full time in this if you have children, um, because it it's involves a huge amount of time on the road. You know, I last year I was on the road seven. This year I'm hoping to take that down. I used to be on the road ten months of the year. Um, you know, and it's very difficult to have work life balance when you are you know off in strange countries for that much of the year. Right. So, so what did you study in college? Did it, was that completely unrelated, or so in college? What I did was I I had a major in environmental studies, and I essentially had sort of a non-official minor in art. I had um, I went to UCSC, which is you know really sort of relaxed, um, flexible university, and they I got a environmental studies degree, but they allowed me to take part in their photo classes um, mm. as well. Um, so I was. It was quite interesting because, you know, I would kind of go in there with my, um, you know, sea otters or elephant seals and everybody else, you know, it was like purple hair and safety pins through the years and we're all doing <laughs> seriously fine art photography. Which awesome. You know, I really appreciated their work. And I have to admit, none of them really appreciated my sea otters. Yeah, so <laughs> it was interesting. It also gave me tough skin. You know, people say you need tough skin and you need to be able to handle criticism and man that experience gave it to me because I just got creamed in the peer reviews <laughs> you know like this who, is an art this is a sea otter who doesn't pet. like art. sea otters who doesn't like sea otters <laughs> what is their problem it's, yeah. just, it's not art Joanne but, <laughs> but they're so they're natural art I mean you know they're just yeah well animals. and I truly believe wildlife photography is art actually I really do mm -hmm. you know I I don't sort of parade around calling myself an artist, but it is absolutely an art form working with light and composition, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of artistic elements that go into it, for sure, but there's also a lot of science elements that go into it. Mm -hmm. You know, half of what I do is knowing animal behavior and being able to predict what their movements are going to be next or where I should be or, you know, a, a huge amount, I think, of wildlife photography is actually about wildlife and wildlife behavior mm -hmm. and their relationship to their environment and photography is kind of secondary you know that's kind of stuff mm -hmm. that I sort of said to myself I can teach that to myself um, there are a lot of how-to books out there but it's very difficult to sort of teach the ecology part to yourself mm -hmm. so that's sort of why I chose to go with environmental studies over an art degree because I just knew that that would be incredibly important in this career and it turned out to be true even to this day you know when I go into a story 
I research it ahead of time for weeks or months, talk to um, conservationists and researchers that are working with that species. I read every paper that's been done in recent times. I get all the books. I have this huge collection. You can see some of them behind me, but I have books all over my house of like field guides and you know behavioral books, books on, on all my stories that I'm going to go on. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, that's great. That's good to know. And well, and it shows, um, you know, just from the photos I've seen, um, and then then you get the the great shots where there's an expression or some something sort of you feel as if something's emanating from the animal, whether it's just a peace or an anger or a you know franticness or something like you just that that's what a photographer needs to do is to capture whatever it is. Uh, the the animals are going through, and you know I'm trying not to anthropomorphize, but there there is something you sense through the images. Yeah, there's a right moment for sure, and I mean as you can see, I really enjoy interaction between animals, whether it's between mother and baby, or or you know two adults or whatever, or predator and prey. But my one of my big passions is is interaction for sure, and capturing that moment of like the right interaction. The the example I use all the time is the lion book has a photo of the lion cub meeting dad for the first time. And so that was like, you know, I had worked with these cubs. I'd found the cubs when they were two weeks old. At that point, mom was like stashed them in a den and was keeping them there. But I knew from reading about lion behavior, I knew that eventually she'd bring them out of the den to meet the rest of the pride. Yeah, that's it. There it is. Yeah. This yeah. And so I just sort of hoped that it would happen um, during the right light and, and when I was there, not, you know, during the middle of the night when I was sleeping in my tent. And and it did. And I was very lucky. But, you know, every day I was anticipating, is this going to be the day that she lets them out to meet the rest of the pride? So sort of waiting for that time. And let me tell you, with lions, there's a lot of waiting. You know, it's 21 hours of sleeping with lions throughout the day. So um, there's a lot of, of downtime. But, you know, moments like that make it make it all worthwhile for sure. But that may be one of the examples I was going to ask you about, and we're still on this topic, Joanne. That That's fine. I, I was thinking, you know, which which comes first, the the pictures or the narrative? And I can see that they 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 grow more naturally since you're interested in this uh, in this sort of life cycle thing, uh, story of young animals growing up, and that sort of is a, a built-in narrative, and you're going to capture that. But I'm thinking, surely. There are going to be the occasional shots where you say, I really, 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 really want the picture of this happening. And then you have to wait and wait and wait, and they just won't do it. Um, well, yeah. I mean, before I embark on any story, I have a shot list. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I usually develop that shot list at, at home during my research. And then when I get into the field, I have a shot list of everything that I want to capture. But there are absolutely times where I anticipate getting a shot and I and I don't get it. You know, a good example is I just did this this tiger den story of newborn tigers in the wild, and um, I really wanted a photo of mom carrying the cub in her mouth, one of the cubs in her mouth, and I never got it. Um, you know, I got a, a lot of other amazing photos, and it was you know really awesome kind of groundbreaking work, but. I didn't get that. And let me tell you, I still think about that. You know, we, I, yeah. I always joke around with people that there's like a grieving process mm -hmm. when you come home and you do your edit. The first stage is grieving over what you didn't get, whether it's like you screwed it up and didn't do it right, operator <laughs> error, which I still do. And I'm not ashamed. Lens of cap on? <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> not lens cap on, but, you know, camera movement or just, you know, stupid things that we do and screw up. Or, or whether it's that, you know, the animal didn't perform and they didn't do what I, what I wanted them to do. But yeah, there is. It is funny. There is like a, a grieving process to the edit. So what what goes on your shot list? How do you develop that? What are you? What are the things you're thinking about when you're deciding what you would like to your targets to be? I think it depends on what the story hook is. So I usually know, you know, if it's a growing up baby story, mm -hmm. then you know, it's what what does the mother do with the baby? You know, what are the things that I can expect? Does she groom the baby? How does she groom the baby? Does she use her fingers? Does she use her tongue? Um, you know, how, how does she feed the baby? Is she hidden when she's feeding the baby? Is she out in the open? Is the baby feeding while she's climbing? Like, you know, all these different things. And how does she leave the babies in the end? Does she just slink off while they're sleeping right. like cheetahs do? Or, and you know, these you know from doing behavioral research beforehand about your I know from doing behavioral research beforehand usually, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, and some of it too is, 
is quite uh, universal. Like if working with cats, there are some universal similarities between mm -hmm. species that I know. But when I'm embarking on a new one, for instance, my project right now is koalas, and I've been doing a lot of work in Australia with koalas. And so, you know, koalas are very new to me. It's the first marsupial I've worked with, you know, never worked with pouch young. And so it's been really exciting and very different, but, you know, I had to do a lot of research and reading ahead of time mm -hmm. because it's a, it's a new subject. It's something I'm not very familiar with. But the shot list, you know, it, it can be completely different if we're talking about, like, a conservation story or um, mm -hmm. a research story. Um, you know, if I'm following a biologist around in the field um, and he's doing a workup on an animal, then it's my shot list becomes, okay, I want it, him doing the ear tag. I need him taking blood work. I need him taking hair samples. You know, then it, it's completely different. But I think mm -hmm. since I work in a story way um, and, you know, my, my parents were both journalists, so I think that I, I'm always thinking about the story and telling the story. So I'm thinking about how I'm going to tell it, but also what's the hook, what's exciting, what's newsy, what's going to pull people in, what's going to make the editor want to purchase my story, and what it's going to make the readers interested right. in reading it. So you can adjust as you go, but you actually do have the story pretty much in mind, at least a, a draft story in mind that you're working with that guides what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. And then sometimes my story will be like completely turned upside down when I get into the field. Yeah. Sometimes something amazing happens that I wasn't expecting, sure. or like I discover something sometimes really horrible in the way of conservation that I think needs to come out or, or whatever mm -hmm. it is, and my story can be completely turned around. Or it can be completely bust, you know? Sometimes you just don't find the animal or they don't perform and you come home with nothing. <laughs> yes. So. So, so let's talk about uh, your work with conservation. This, it seems almost like a natural progression. When you are hanging out with animals all the time, Yeah. Uh, I think this is just going to happen, especially if you, um, I was thinking when you work with those charismatic animals, you know, that those draw a lot of attention. Yeah. As, as well but yeah let, let's go ahead and hear what what you're supporting what what's close to your heart now as far as conservation is is concerned and some of the statistics of wh why should we all care right and you know I think so one of the things I've always been extremely interested in conservation um, ever since I was a child and you know I was like the little kid where instead of getting a gift I asked my parents to like adopt an acre of the rainforest or something like I was that kind of kid and then you know growing up in my adult life um, I think there was a period where you know I, I did do a lot of sort of wildlife conservation in my local area but then when I I had this sort of three-year stint in the Maasai Mara where I lived in a bush camp and I was you know all this sort of natural history drama was kind of unfolding around me and it was all just beautiful and you know these are protected animals and this and that and I just sort of got involved in all these different stories and one of the things that struck me profoundly is that I started noticing that um, I of course got to know a lot of the researchers and the rangers while I was there mm -hmm. and the rangers and I were you know pretty friendly I spoke Swahili and we chit chatted all the time and they started to tell me like oh yeah we you know we caught some rain, some poachers up on Ingrari Hill last night you know and I, and I think God you know I was on Ingrari Hill with my cheetah families like there were poachers around and I started to realize the poachers were operating right under my nose. Like everywhere I was going, poachers were there mm. at night. I was out mm. during the day. They were there during the day doing their slaughtering or hanging the meat in the trees, whatever. Um, and, and I didn't know they were there. I had absolutely no clue. It was like, you know, they were just completely invisible. And I, and it really hit me during one wildebeest migration. Um, I went out and I, and I asked them, I'd asked the rangers for quite some time if I could tag along with them while they were doing their anti-poaching and, and go out with the anti-poaching unit. So they let me come on this um, sort of patrol where they would go through these bushes and look for snares. And on the first patrol we went on, we found 300 snares in one day. And it just really, that day profoundly affected me because I realized the scale that this was happening on all around me and the magnitude of, of what was going on and um, I asked you know can I hang out with you for a few weeks and and just sort of show you guys and luckily to my surprise they said yes and so you know I went out on these ambushes where they caught these poachers and we raided these bush camps and this and that it was all very exciting and you know I got some some photos out of it that were extremely 
But it, that was, I think, my first sort of like, you know, okay, let's get involved in, in this kind of issue um, and let's document it. And um, that was also an interesting learning experience for me because those images um, were quite dark and, and it was very difficult to find a home for them in terms of a media story. Um, and so the, the balance of having some warm, funny, fuzzy images to go with dark images is really important if you're going to try to get it out into the general public. So, you know, anyway, that sort of started this whole thing of where I wanted to bring in conservation more into my story pieces. And I, you know, went and worked on Ngamba Island where they take chimpanzees that have been rescued from the bushmeat trade and sort of give them this sort of semi-wild life and teach them essentially how to be chimpanzees and worked with, you know, orphan orangutans in Borneo and that kind of thing, um, documenting what they were doing, and then taking it one step further and saying, okay, you know, we've got these images, we've documented what's happening, how can we use these images to, to help their causes? So I, you know, of course, like every wildlife photographer, I get an enormous amount of um, requests for free imagery, and I can't say yes to all those, unfortunately, mm -hmm. as much as I would love to. So I decided I'm going to pick kind of like a handful of organizations to support over the long term. Mm -hmm. And the, all of those organizations are people I've actually worked with on the ground, so I know 100% of my heart that every single penny is going to where it should go. Um, and I tend to support small ones. I don't support WWF or big ones. Um, so I do these sort of small grassroots organizations. And then we use my imagery to, to raise awareness or actually to, to raise money sometimes um, and to, to do, um, you know, direct fundraising with whether it's prints or selling products or me speaking on their behalf and then, you know, charging a, a fee per head and donating all the money to that organization, that kind of thing. So, you know, I think that that, one of my things, it's very difficult with these children's books because they're, they're so young, right? But the back page is all about conservation and, um, you know, it, well, there's some natural history, but some conservation and, and, and how kids can, can get more involved and pointing them out to a website where they can go for conservation. Uh, because four to seven is a little bit too young for them to sort of get really involved in the conservation issues. The older age is seven to 14 is a little bit easier. Um, but, but you know, but if you, have, if you, you have engage books them for that, the the seven to fourteen, or that's just in Ranger Rick, for instance. So that's in Ranger Rick, but also I'm working on a series right now on wildlife rescue, and that will be ages seven to fourteen, and that will touch on a lot of the conservation issues, and that will be, you know, that's where the sort of real balance is coming in, and the sort of what, how much do we tell kids, particularly when you're talking about like the bushmeat trade with apes. I mean, that kind of stuff is so horrific. Right. Um, and trying to to get it in a way that these seven to fourteen year olds will digest it. But but yeah, I mean, so so. But I think what where I'm going with the four to seven year olds is like I think one of the things trying to get kids jazzed on conservation is planting the seed of loving wildlife. That's step mm -hmm. one, you know, and and getting them excited about wildlife and getting them to love cheetahs is like the next natural step. Is okay. I love cheetahs. What can I do to help cheetahs? What can I do to protect cheetahs? Right. Um, so, you know, my, I guess my hope is with Eye on the Wild, with this Young Kids series, that it will get them jazzed and, and get them inspired and get them loving animals. For me, um, it was like going to local wildlife sanctuaries and zoos. Um, zoos got me really jazzed about African animals. And, um, and then seeing documentaries of Jane Goodall and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so the conservation thing is something that particularly in recent years I've really sort of feel really good about and, and really want to do more of and dedicate more time and trying to do everything I can. There's a, you know, a couple of my favorites, Sumatran Orangutan Society is doing incredible work with orangutans on the ground um, and I'm a patron of theirs and I do everything I can to help their causes. Cheetah Conservation Man is another one that's been absolutely amazing. And some of them are real little ones, like Kabali Chimpanzee Project is a tiny little organization, but doing incredible work of, of snares, um, snare removal um, in, mm. in Uganda. Um, and so, you know, I do sometimes choose to support these little ones that are working regionally because there's, there's no money lost in overhead. And, you know, I'm very suspicious just sometimes from direct experience, which I won't get into, but, you know, of, of working with these organizations on the ground and really seeing who's actually making a difference, you know, other than, like, just driving around with a logo on the vehicle, which we see a lot of in Africa, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, finding out who's, who's actually doing something. 
I think I think you're right that that without even doing um, overt uh, recruiting to a conservation cause, that teaching the the four to sevens uh, about animals, developing empathy, giving them any sort of insight in um, a wildlife that gets ever more remote from city dwellers in this country is is the the strong foundation that you need for at least a later interest, if not you know active involvement, but even the interest uh, that would come from that is is a very valuable thing. Mm -hmm. I do. I think our greatest challenge with wildlife conservation, I genuinely believe, is the the disconnect in with mm -hmm. nature and children right now that we're seeing in future generations, and it is alarming and very scary. And I think about. You know, I lived in a suburban area, but I had a real connect with the animals that were living in my yard, and I was out in the mud all the mm -hmm. time, and I was climbing trees all the time, and I didn't grow up in a rural area. I was in suburbia, so we can do it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think it's just a mindset of, of getting our kids out there in the dirt again and, and getting them to look at the birds in the trees and getting them to look at the squirrels and appreciate them and think of them as something besides nuisances in the yard. And what, what better way to do that than to tell engaging stories that right. causes kids to say, I want to go out and look at worms. Or right. <laughs> whatever they want to do. Right. I'm not doing that, but yeah. <laughs> That's how come yeah. I became a biologist. But uh, <laughs> Well, I mean, I did. We lived in Guam for a while. My dad was Air Force, and I just boonie stomped all the time. Awesome. And yeah, so it was it was great. Although I became a molecular biologist, but still that connection to yeah. nature was really set set the seed uh, for that. Right. The, um, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, which sounds like a lot of fun. If I were someone interested in photography, is that you actually run photo tours, like so people could sign up for a fee, and everything's included. Uh, their stay and uh, opportunities to shoot and to learn from you how to yeah. take great photographs. Um, so tell me about some of those that you run. So I run about three of these a year um, and I do it to, to sort of different locations. There's a couple that I offer kind of regularly like Costa Rica I offer every year um, but then I switch up my locations as well um, partly to make it really interesting for me but also to I have clients that travel with me and want to go to different places so they you know they've gone to Costa Rica and they don't want to go again with me so they're gonna go somewhere else with me so um, you know it's it's a for me it's a great opportunity to work with people and I love teaching so and I actually am very social which is a little ironic because I spent a lot of time on my own um, and you know one of the hard things about living in that bush camp for three years is that it was very isolating and you know there were days that it would go by where I didn't speak to anyone at all um, and I am a pretty social person. I like being with other people, so I do still do an extraordinary amount of work on my own, but um, with these tours, it's really fun because you get in this small group of people where people have the same passion and the same interest, and everyone's jazzed, and it's kind of cool to be with people who are as jazzed about a lemur as I am, you know, and you kind of feed off that energy, um, which is really fun in creating imagery as well. So, so with my tours, I like to keep them small, and um, you know, I do a lot of teaching if people want it. Some of my clients don't want teaching. Some of them, you know, already know a lot about photography. They have, you know, amazing is going to be put in the right place at the time because they know that I'll do that and I'll give them a good wildlife opportunity. And other people come, like literally with a camera, not even out of the box, and want to learn. You know, and that's great. I love working with beginners. Beginners are usually super enthusiastic and really jazzed. Um, but it's just a really fun way. You know, for my clients, it's a fun way for them to learn. But in the company of, of other people, it's a social thing. It's fun. Um, and it also makes it easier to travel when you're doing a small group and safer um, in many places. Um, some people are, you know, frightened of going to places alone. Um, and so, you know, it's a lot more comfortable for them to join a tour where they know they're going to be taken care of, you know, and, and myself and, and my local guide are going to make sure all their meals are really good and that they're sleeping in comfortable beds and, you know, no one's going to, well, if there's a tick up someone's nose, we're going to deal with it kind of thing and, you know, <laughs> you're going to have someone to sympathize and, and that kind of thing. So, you know, they're just fun. They're just downright, you know, a fun thing to do. I look forward to my tours every year. If I had more time, I would do more of them, but I just don't have time. 
Right. So, so who helps you organize that? Because it looks like a lot of organization, or do you set that all up? I do just... it all on my own. Yeah. Oh. So, wow. you know, I yes, I imagine <laughs> these, you know, setting up where you're going to stay here, and then you're going to stay here, and then this is how we get our food. Well, or... I do have like a ground operator that oh, I work right. with in some of these places, but some of these places, it's like, um, you know, I work with five different companies, and one person's handling the airfare, and the other one's handling mm -hmm. like the okay. the ground transportation and that kind of thing um, but yeah it's a, it's an extraordinary production which is one of the reasons why I don't have time to do more than three because there's a huge amount of legwork that goes into it ahead of time yeah. and then on the ground you know it's pretty exhausting but I get an adrenaline rush um, when I'm in the field so you know going you know straight for like 14 or 15 hours a day for three weeks would kill some people but for me I'm just um, I don't know I throw off that kind of thing but and these are, you know, some of the places that I go to are pretty um, exciting places where everybody gets, you know, really jazzed. And some of them are hard places, too. I run India, and that can be trying for some people. Even though tigers are amazing, India is a, a difficult place to... I've just been to India in February with a reporting project. We were looking at child survival issues, so that was a bit tough. But India is a culture shock. It's know? exhausting, yeah. It's exhausting. yeah. Uh, so yeah. if I went, I would definitely, I, it's no secret, I think, to anybody who's followed me even for three minutes on any social media that I love slaws. So I would, <laughs> if I really wanted to learn something about photography, and some days I go, boy, I wish I knew how to take a picture of this. Yeah. I would go, I would go to Costa Rica. I would go to the sloth sanctuary. Or I would definitely, I'd love to go to Monterey Bay and, you know, yeah. see the otters for yeah. sure. And, so well, be, Costa Rica is actually kind of my favorite one, um, and that's one of the reasons why I'm going to just come out and confess. That's one of the reasons why I offer it every year is because I love it, and yeah. Costa Rica is such an easy country to be in, and, you know, no one really, knock on wood, no one really gets sick, and people, it's very, it's safe for the most part, you know, outside of San Jose, it's such a safe country. Um, it's an easy country, and this is going to sound horrible, but it's easy because everybody speaks English, so there's no language barrier. The roads are mostly paved, so you don't have you know grumpy people who are getting car sick. It's a very easy place to run a tour, and the wildlife just like jumps in your lap. That's one of the best things about Costa Rica is like you just walk around the garden of your eco lodge, and there's a toucan or a macaw or like a monkey right above your bungalow. So. If you don't have to like sit there and wait hours and hours for a tiger to show up at a water hole, you know, it's a very different game. I don't see so, any yeah, disgrace of, in, in doing something easy every now yes, and then. Yes, I agree. Um, so will one of your future books be about sloths? Yeah, yeah, it's in the plans, yeah. So it'll be about <laughs> the sloth sanctuary and everything that they do there, and it'll be a big fundraiser for them as well. Okay, so and then you said you had two books coming out in this um, Eye on the Wild series. So the, if one is Slaws, what's the other going to be? Okay, my book agent probably would hate that I'm doing this because we oh. haven't actually signed yet, but I got word <laughs> last week that we've got Tiger and Elephant coming, which is great. Oh, great. So, Wonderful. Yeah, so that'll be coming in 2014. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I noticed then, I'm looking at these, all mammals. So uh -huh. what's, what's up with the reptiles and the birds and everything else? Do you just have a better connection with mammals? or? Um, I do. Yeah. I historically have had more of a connection and more of a for mammals. But what I will say is that I'm working on a project on egrets right now. Okay. And um, I've been um, doing a little egret rescue myself, and I have absolutely fallen in love with egrets. Um, so this could be the start of, of a bird thing for me. I, you know, mammals have always, I've always been, you know, and it's awful, but I've always been attracted to sort of your, his, you know, your kind of quintessential sexy megafauna, you know, big cats, bears. Um, and I got really into little carnivores when I was in the Mara and that sort of opened my eyes. Wow. These little guys are really cool. Jackals, foxes, that kind of thing. Um, and then, you know, I've been working with some backyard wildlife here locally um, and then doing some egret stuff as well. So yeah, I'm kind of getting turned on to different things. I have something I want to return to that we almost, we sort of passed by a little bit earlier. Uh -huh. And Joanne knows that, that one of my EDA speaks is science is trying to get people to see science as a cultural activity. 
as something that they can integrate with their everyday life and gives them tools and additional ways to look at things. And on the other side of that, when we, um, we read Buzz Aldrin's book, Mission to Mars, what's more technical than that? And at one point, he just sort of breaks out and he says, you know, we spend all this time talking about the importance of science, technology, engineering, and math known as STEM. And he says, where's art? Why is there no art? And, you know, I cheered at that point because I want to see science as a cultural activity. I want to see art as something as, that offers additional tools for people as well. All of these things integrated together. And so now I can say, well, you have overt stories whenever you show a picture of wildlife. It brings to mind questions about how they live and how we respond to them and where they are and many, many things. Um, but there's always an aesthetic response as well. And so, hooray for integrating art and science. And I don't know, there's no question, this is just the topic. But you think about these things because you said so and you want to take attractive pictures and you want to show attractive imagery to people but you also like it now that it shows the story, and the story is about the biology, the animal, their behavioralism, and all of these many things. And I think that's a lovely example of, of integrating all of these things into a, you know, a whole person that's really important and uh, is going to be important for an ecological uh, environmental outlook later in life, too. Yeah, and I think one of the things that I've always felt in my career is that I kind of walk this sort of line between science and art and I don't I'm not a scientist but I'm also not really an artist I'm like somewhere in between and I know compared to a lot of very artistic talented refers I work in a much more science like way um, and and I think that um, there is sort of, you know, wildlife photographers do kind of walk that line between. Some wildlife photographers are actually proper biologists and are mm -hmm. actually scientists. Um, and I, you know, I never really felt, it's interesting as a child, I never felt like I really belonged in the sciences, but I also didn't really belong in the arts either. And I didn't really feel like I belonged anywhere in, until I started doing wildlife photography. And then it was like, this is exactly where I belong. But yeah, I think you do sort of bring those two things together. Because even when you're photographing really horrific stuff, you know, some of my predation stuff, I've got some dramatic images of um, a good example is African wild dog down a warthog. And it's pretty brutal. Um, but, you know, I try to do it in a visually beautiful way so it's like this brutally beautiful image of um, all this drama going on and dust flying and you know something really horrible happening but done in a really sort of nice aesthetic way um, mm -hmm. so I think that's what we we try to do as photographers is to try to you know even war photographers, some of their most horrific yeah. things are, are beautiful in, 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 a, in a very heartbreaking way. Right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I think that we do try to show people beauty, for sure. Okay. Um, and work with light yeah. and composition and bring the artistic elements. Yeah, yeah. It does. It, it, and some it, of that is a gut thing, thing, too. Some of it is like, sorry. Oh, I sorry, go ahead. It brings all those together in a you know, in a gestalt way that's like bigger than either of the of the components. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a, a great thing. Well, and I think when I, you know, look yeah. at an image and not yeah. being necessarily trained in like this is exactly the best way to have the light, you know, so not having that technical background except for, you know, having spent a few years, you know, in front of the camera, which is different than wildlife photography. But when you... Um, you know, I, I think when it's an attractive photograph, people just know, they instinctively know this is great photography. And then, you know, a photographer could analyze why it's great. But, you know, to capture uh, something that people just instinctively say, this has captured something incredible. Yeah. Um, you get I, this sort of talent. Yeah. Yeah, and you get a gut feeling like, you know, there's just a, you know, and then the same thing for photographers when they take a good image, you just, you just know when it's good. Like you just, you feel <laughs> okay. it, you feel it in your gut, you just know it, you know, when you hit that shutter button and, and you know when it's going to be good and when it's going to be bad. 
There's a lot of bad ones too. <laughs> yes. Do you ever have where you you're on the edge, like so you've got two images and you're like, ah, I'm, you know, which one's better, or is it almost always clear? No, all the time. And I think I'm slightly OCD with that kind of thing because <laughs> I will, you know, I've gotten better over the years, but I will just be labor decision like that, just like, oh, you know, and then someone else will look at it and they'll go, those two are identical. And I go, no, they're not. <laughs> they're totally different. I mean, sometimes I will, you know, ask someone in my life to have a look. Um, and sometimes it'll be someone who knows about photography, but often it'll be someone who, um, I, I often like to ask people who aren't interested in wildlife and aren't interested in photography. My brother, he's really interested in sports, um, so and he's not into wildlife or photography at all. So I often say, which one's better? Because sometimes that's our audience. You know, these are we're trying to pull in people who aren't interested. So um, you know, I try to keep that in mind depending on the project when I'm asking people what they think. Well, and, and that is part of what we're trying to do here with Read Science is we, how do we relate science to these topics to the general public, not to the experts in the field. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're doing yeah. exactly what, you know, we, we have a passion for promoting. Um, right. It looks like we're getting down to the end of an hour here, uh, and, mm -hmm. you know, it's always terrible. I hate this part, but I'm wondering if there's anything else that you would like to add that we forgot to ask that you think is particularly <laughs> important, or, or you know everybody else asks you and uh, you think people need to know. Or you don't um, want to answer. Or you don't want to answer, yeah. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I guess in terms of um, the books, I just... You know, I really hope that whether it's my books or somebody else's books on natural history, I really hope that parents out there will bring natural history into the house for children, um, you know, in the form of books and also take their kids out. Um, I know we talked about that a little bit, but, you know, take kids out on bird walks and, and um, you don't have to go far. You know, there are things in your backyard, but also, you know, take kids to the local zoo and get kids jazzed about cheetahs and lions um, you know it's it's the whole world that's gonna save cheetahs not just the countries in Africa that have cheetahs mm -hmm. in fact we're probably more important than they are if we all care in the developed world um, and put enough pressure on governments particularly with animals like tigers um, who are slipping away before our eyes um, and to, to you know to get our future generations excited about tigers and and some of these species I go to some of these areas and I don't want to be too doom and gloom but you know, just got back from Madagascar and and it was one of the few places where I I don't think my niece will see those lemurs in her lifetime like that I think by the time my niece is old enough to go to Madagascar many of those species I saw this year will be gone um, and that to me is is, is extremely um, depressing and you know it only from pressure from developed nations where, where Madagascar would do something different um, and, and it does make a huge difference I think to get our future generations involved. So we're, uh, so this video will be um, up online on our Read Science YouTube channel and what we'll do is we'll put links to all the organizations you've listed in the back of your books here um, and then awesome. you know uh, we'll collect from you other organizations that you uh, have a heart for, and we'll make sure that that's available. So when Great. people uh, come visit, then you know that will all be in one place. Uh, we appreciate you coming on, and uh, definitely, I love your books. And really, anybody out there, if you have small kids somewhere in your life, I uh, collect <laughs> them all. I mean, if my kids were little, they loved series, you know, and they'd be just like. You know, they read them all, and they just yeah. stick them in a pile and sit on the floor and read them. And I know they would have done that with this if they were still that little, um, but they grow so fast. I um, yeah. Your enthusiasm, well, have grandkids, I'm sure. <laughs> your enthusiasm, Joanne says, it's not just restricted to uh, young people. I think you've enjoyed reading these books. Yourself. Yeah, I know, <laughs> guilty. You know, but uh, this. Yeah. This, for me, I'm a biologist, right? So this kind of stuff <laughs> really is, you know, and, and, you know, then my guilty pleasure of my little stuff. Yeah. Math oh. cloth. <laughs> yeah. I know, isn't it? Nice. I like that. <laughs> I know. As I've, I've got to bring the cloth out a few times here on, you know, I didn't bring out for Buzz Aldrin. I don't think he would have. No. Really it, no. But um, I, I'm so. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe he would have. We found out he likes coconut ice cream. So. Mm -hmm. 
You know, maybe Buzz likes sloths. You, you never know. Who doesn't like sloths? <laughs> Who doesn't? So, um, so okay. So we're looking forward to two more books in your Eye on the Wild series. We're looking forward to. Is it a book or a series of books for middle school, seven to fourteen? Is that one book? It'll be Wildlife Rescue. And that's it's one. It's going to be a series. A series, great, great, fantastic. And yeah. then, um, and yeah. is that all that's in the works right now? Um, other than all your magazine work, I mean, it's in the way of books, yeah. There's some adult books I'm working on that I can't really talk about yet. Yeah. Um, some coffee table books, but. Yeah, no, and it's mostly just cruising on the magazine stories still. Okay, great. Oh, well, that's fantastic. And yeah. um, and I, like I said, I follow, Susie has a Facebook page that you, everybody can go check out because you can keep up where her images are ending up and uh, mm -hmm. then you know, recognize she's just about everywhere. So, Susie, thank you so much. This was so fantastic. I'm a fan. Thank you, Susie. <laughs> and I appreciate it. So, um, and I guess thank you for every everybody for watching. We won't have another hangout until July, um, where we've got a couple lined up, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll keep you up to date on those in the future. So, okay, I will see you sometime in July. <laughs>